Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about what's going on in the world of the Beatles newswise. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, best known for my syndicated Beatles program called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by my co-host, my partner in crime, Mr. Beatles Examiner himself, and that, of course, is Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Partner in crime? <laughs> <laughs> It's How's an affectionate. Going, it's an affectionate term. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you should look at it that way. Okay. On today's program, we have a special guest with us on the phone, and um, as I said in the previous show, because there's so much activity on the McCartney side of things lately, there's going to be a number of programs that we're going to be doing, and with the fact that Wings Over America has just been remastered on CD, and there is a, a deluxe box set that has just been released, as well as Rock Show coming out on DVD and Paul on tour and everything, we thought that we might invite Joshua Lappin Bertoni as a special guest to our show. He is uh, an expert, especially on the wing side of things. And we welcome Joshua here to our program. Thanks for having me. Now, if you guys are partners in crime, you know, what are we getting into here? Do I, do I need an alibi? Um, should, I, <laughs> should, should I be keeping records? Do I need to be concerned? No, just let us get away with murder. That's right. <laughs> Did I actually say that? That was very quick of me, and that's not normally like me. I know. <laughs> you jumped the murder pretty quickly. I mean, you know, before it was crime, I was thinking, you know, petty theft, or maybe we might knock over a bank, but, you know... Uh, no, you never know. Mike, has gone all the way for manslaughter. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I just want to know... First of all, Joshua, I, I must tell the folks listening that the first time I became aware of you, really, was from a Facebook page that you developed, which happens to be called Get Wings in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And in addition to that, you're involved with a radio special on Wings, which maybe you could talk about. And you also have a weekly show on Beatlesarama.com, which features the music of Wings. And it's called, what's the name? Wednesdays with Wings. That's a catchy title. <laughs> <laughs> well, well what? I, I go for the alliteration because um, when I did my campus radio show, which uh, still exists in podcast form, it was Bertoni Beetle Bonanza. So I figure, you know, you got to keep up with the alliteration. And luckily, you know, uh, McCartney picked a band name that had a first letter that also had a day of a week with the same first letter. So Now, what time um, exactly are you on? Yeah, it's little segments. They air throughout the day on beatles Arama. They're little segments. They are throughout the day on beatles Arama, you know. So whenever you tune in um, throughout the day, you'll hear me introduce a Wings song, and sometimes I'll throw in either a vintage McCartney interview talking about the song from the 70s, or I'll throw in um, an interview that I have did with some of the Wings members. Um, in addition to the um, Wednesday with Wings and everything else that you mentioned, I am working on a book about Wings. It's going to be a compendium, and... I'm hoping to get it out by next year. Um, you guys will hear about that as it develops. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, there, there's a lot of things cooking in the Wings kitchen. Okay. <laughs> now, my okay. first question is, is, is an obvious one. And since you are a big Beatles fan, why, why the fascination specifically with Wings and, and this time period? Okay, well, uh, thanks for asking. It's, it's one that I've pondered myself, and... I think part of it is, is in this Beatles world of, you know, people doing different websites, radio shows, books, and everything like that, I think you all kind of have to find, you know, your little niche, you know, like there's people who's, you know, kind of the Ringo guy, and, you know, you got uh, uh, people like uh, Jude Kessler, who's, like, devoted herself to John Lennon and is doing that great book series, and so I kind of wanted to find a little bit of territory that was interesting, and not to say uncharted, because, I mean, everyone's covered everything about the Beatles that's out there, but so something that hasn't been covered a lot, you know, my own little niche that I can, you know, become an expert on and learn my craft. And with Wings, there is such a lot out there, and I'm also kind of fascinated by their legacy, because it's, I don't like to repeat, you know, some of the party lines that McCartney uses in interviews, but it is true that Wings... They had to live in the shadow of the Beatles, and even during the Wings Over America tour, a lot of the interviews backstage were asking them about the Beatles sergeant uh, offer to get the Beatles back together and That's asking right. if the Beatles were going to join him backstage. Mm -hmm. 
even to their very, very last concert, you know, uh, Campuchia, people were waiting for John Lennon to go on stage. And that was when Paul made the joke when the little robot came on stage. It's not John Lennon. <laughs> so they had, that was a very, very big legacy that they had to, you know, create their own identity. And they succeeded. And it's kind of gone in the other direction now because uh, now that Paul McCartney is Paul McCartney, you know, huge star, not that he never wasn't a huge star. It's in retrospect and, you know, the way people talk about Wings, it's kind of become secondary to Paul McCartney. And I kind of want to bring Wings' legacy back. And that's not to say that Paul wasn't a huge part of Wings, you know, because obviously Paul was the driving force, but that Wings was more than just Paul. Well, that's one thing I wanted to bring up. Did you, uh, I know I've talked about this many times, but I want to get your perspective. Do you actually perceive Wings to be really a group effort? It, it is a group effort. I mean, again, obviously, yeah, you know, a, a primary number of the songs were written by Paul, um, probably 90-something percent, and the vocals were. And Paul was, you know, the big attraction to it. But that doesn't mean that Paul did it by himself. There's a lot of groups out there where you have one singer who overshadows the other. Um, there's lots of bands where a lot of people can just name the front man, and they don't know who the drummer or the bassist is. And the interesting thing about the Wings uh, group effort question is, when I was seeing Rock Show in Fort Lauderdale with Joe Johnson of Beetle Brunch last week, one thing that I noticed is there was six vocals on that concert tour that were not Paul McCartney vocals. You would never see Paul McCartney do that on his current tours now. That's right. But I think that that's yeah. really important. They, he set aside six vocal spots for other members of the band. Not to mention the horn section, which he does not have. You know, he doesn't have outside musicians anymore. You know, right. Yeah, well, I've said uh, on numerous occasions that I really think that Paul made a very concerted effort to make Wings a band. And even if you go back to the early days when they had uh, Henry McCullough in the band, he had a number on stage, Henry's Blues. Henry's Blues. And uh, Denny Lane, early on, had songs like Say You Don't Mind. You know, there are certain songs that they brought out live and also gradually on the studio albums to the point where when we got to Venus and Mars, you not only had Denny Lane vocals on Spirits of Ancient Egypt and um, what else from Denny? I think that was it. But you had Medicine Jar from Jimmy McCulloch and then on Wings at the Speed of Sound, every member had at least one vocal. So and I on, think and that on Wings Over America, you had uh, Denny doing Go Now. I mean, well, you had Denny know. doing five songs. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, as I just watched Rock Show on the big screen a few days ago, I was just thinking to myself, to everybody that's seen Paul McCartney from 1989-90 on, who basically know him for those tours, if they watch this now, you know, how are they going to react to that? Because most of what Paul does or has been doing since then has been heavily Beatles with some solo music, with a few songs from his latest album. Whereas in this time period, because radio played his music, and because he had so much momentum then, the previous years going from, say, Red Rose Speedway through Speed of Sound, with number one albums, one after another, and all these hits, he was able to not only play the hits, but he played album cuts, which also got airplay back then. So it was a whole different era then, but... My point is that on those studio albums, he brought out the other members. And I think that's what he really wanted to do all along. And he managed to achieve it. And you look at the Wings Over America tour and you look at Rock Show. And this was Wings, to me, at the pinnacle of what they could be as a band. And you even look at the interviews that they were doing around that tour. And I'm seeing interviews where... Um now, there's a few times where someone will just kind of single in on Paul and occasionally Paul and Linda, but there's a lot of interviews where Wings is interviewed as a group. Right. Um, you, you know, Jimmy is there, Joe is there, Denny's there. It's, and again, you don't see that nowadays. I mean, you know, and Paul has some good musicians with him now. This is nothing against them. Right. It's just a totally different environment then. And when Paul appears on stuff to promote his tours, it's usually just him. He doesn't have um, Brian Ray uh, sitting with him. He doesn't have Wicks sitting with him doing the interviews. He was doing that uh, with these incarnations of Wings, even up until the Back to the Egg days. Um, I'm, trying, I'm finding a lot of obscure footage uh, in preparation for this book. I have over 30 hours compiled right now, and I'm seeing stuff like Australian you know, TV shows where um, all five members are interviewed. It's, 
uh, they were treated as a group. And at the time of Wings Over America, they were billed as Wings. Now, disappointingly, um, the reissue has it credited to Paul McCartney and Wings, which um, that wasn't the credit that the original album had. But we all know Paul's notorious for switching credits when he could. Huh. Mm -hmm. Why do you think... I, I mean, it's interesting, the point you brought up about um, not being interviewed with Brian Ray and, and Rusty and, all, and, and Abe and everything... It's interesting. Why do you think that happened? That it's the way it is now. I think Paul McCartney is the act now. Um, Paul McCartney is the draw. Not that he wasn't the draw back then, but mm -hmm. you know he's not doing albums with these guys either. I mean, I know they I know that they're appearing on some of his albums, but like Chaos and Creation in the Backyard, that was primarily a McCartney effort. It's um, it's his touring music and his album music is kind of two different animals now. Whereas the Wings career, you know, their album stuff and their touring stuff was, was kind of the same animal at that point. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul is not necessarily touring to promote his latest album. He's touring yeah. because he's having fun doing it, and he picks and chooses whatever he wants to from his entire career. But it's interesting that you brought up the whole Beatles thing, because it's quite ironic that at this time, during the Wings Over America tour in 1976, he had so much success then. I mean, you couldn't ask for more success than what Paul McCartney had at that point, and yet there were, there were people in the media that still brought up the Beatles reunion. It's almost like it was irrelevant how successful he was on his own. The Beatles are such a pop cultural phenomenon that they eclipse almost everything that these guys are going to do for the rest of their lives. And, you know, even with stuff like Wings, where... Um, the very next year after the tour, um, Mole of Kintyre was recorded, and that became the biggest selling single in the United Kingdom. And the single that it dethroned was She Loves You by the Beatles. So, right. you know, and that's not to say that, you know, because Wings sold more albums, that they were better as, as than the Beatles as a person. It's a different time period, you know, records cost more, but it's they were breaking a lot of records that were the Beatles records, but they're still, no matter what records they break, it, always going to be overshadowed by the Beatles. And it's kind of their gift and their curse because a lot of people came to Wings being Beatles fans. I don't think as many people would have listened to Wildlife and Red Rose Speedaway as as good as some tracks in those albums were had they not been Beatles and McCartney fans. Yeah, but at the same time, and in fact, Steve and I just did a show on this, there were a lot of new fans that the Beatles got on their own that didn't know very young fans about their past, especially mm -hmm. in the case of Paul. Yep. I mean, uh, the famous stories about the kids that didn't know that uh, Paul was in a band before Wings. Right. Right. I mean, just the fact that that even exists, that joke, tells you something. That for that period of time, because the solo Beatles were given a decent amount of airplay, especially Paul at, at this particular time in 76, that tells you that to a, a whole new young audience they could discover the solo music without even knowing about the Beatles. And yes, there's always going to be carryover. There's no doubt about it from the Beatle period. But still, I mean, a lot of the fans that went to see Wings in 76 were young kids who really didn't care all that much about what Paul was before Wings. And I think that with the 76 tour, too, um, I, I hesitate to say that McCartney was finally proud of Wings, because I feel like McCartney was proud of, you know, everything that they did. But he was more nervous about showing them off and putting them under that big of a spotlight because, you know, he had these interviews where he talked about how he wanted to do the university tours to break them in because they weren't ready for the big audiences. And then they did, you know, the Wings Over Europe tour because they didn't want to do Britain just yet. And so they were slowly working their way up to America, you know, and working their kinks out. And, of course, there was the lineup changes between them um, then and America. But by the time he got to, I think he was really genuinely proud of them wanted to show them off and um it's amazing how it was a big homecoming for mccartney and not that america was his home but he going back there after you know hitting it big with the beatles uh uh 12 years prior and uh he hadn't done an american tour in 10 years and you look at uh people who attended these concerts and he looked up a lot of old friends that time i think he was ready to you know to reconnect with them and show off his new band um his old Liverpool uh, girlfriend, Dot Roan, came backstage for the Canada shows. Um, oh, really? He, yeah. Yeah. Um, that, in fact, that was how she kind of got closure from um, everything that went on back in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. um, Alan Williams came to one of the shows. Um, obviously, Ringo, very famously. Right. Uh, Peter Asher. The, the list goes on. It's... Um, it, 
because th- those concerts were events. That was not, not the first time a Beatle had toured America because George had the tour, you know, uh, prior to that, which wasn't as successful. But it, it was a different kind of show than what George was doing. So these things were events. There were celebrities at almost every show. And, you know, to, to Paul's credit, you were talking about going back and starting with university tours. He could have easily, just on the strength of his last name alone, he could have started doing huge shows in huge venues after the Beatles, but he didn't do that. He really wanted to start having an identity all to his own with this band, and he, could, he didn't have that much material in the very beginning. So, you know, the very early Wings tours, the shows were only about an hour. You know, so he yep. gradually built up the band to the point where they had enough material and they had enough familiar material where they could do a two and a half show like this. But remember, Pep, remember, Ken, that he had, there was a lot of backlash against Paul because of the breakup. And Josh, I'm, I'm going to ask you, uh, ask you this. What kind of hurdles did, did Wings have initially because of that backlash? Because I remember, I remember a lot of people were really angry at Paul because of that that whole you know breakup uh situation and and you know i mean the way the way he pulled out of the beatles and and it took a long time for people to settle into that do you well, agree then, uh, popularity wise mccartney was very much the underdog because not only um did he announce the breakup of the beatles causing a lot of people to blame him but then um at the end of 1970 he goes ahead and sues the other three so there was a lot of bias against mccartney and um uh, there was a lot of bias. People, there was a lot of bias, but his record sales were still good. I mean, the first McCartney album went to number one in this country, and and Ram sales, went to number two. His sales were good. The reviews were not um, true. Some of it, <laughs> some of it might have been people who legitimately didn't like the album. I think that a lot of it was people who uh, held over some resentment. So he kind of had a lot of you know uh, targets on him, and then putting Linda on stage with Wings because. Um, I think that since Linda died, it's been played down a lot more, and a lot of fans have let it go. But Linda was almost as hated as Yoko back then. You know, I was going to. I brought up a point last time, and and we didn't really get into it. But do you? I, you know, I, my feeling. I have this theory that Linda was basically brought into the group as kind of Paul's equivalent of Yoko. I mean, when when John brought Yoko in. Paul figured he uh, he had to bring Linda in. You do, do you see that? Uh, do you agree with that, or is that is that? I uh, think it's I think it's possible, but the only person who would ever be able to shed light on that is Paul. And if Paul did it to copy John, Paul would never in a million years admit it. Right. But I I certainly think that there was a lot of mirroring each other. Mm-hmm. You know, um, John does something, and Paul says, "I'll see your plastic Ono band, and I'll raise you." Linda and I doing an album together. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. it's, it's possible, and, but we'll never know, really. It's right. just theorizing. Anyway, so um, a point that I want to bring up with you with Wings is, uh, do you think that Paul has actually hurt the image of Wings through the years by clouding the public's judgment about them? Because there are a lot of people who still to this day look at Wings as basically being Paul's backup band, and Paul hasn't really done much to defend that. You know, if you look at um, what's come out now on Wings Over America, and there was a little 10-minute uh, interview that he gave uh, to go along with Rock Show, he, whenever he talks about Wings, it's mainly about him and Linda. And the other musicians in the group, he gives them credit, but he doesn't talk about them too much. He doesn't try in any way to elevate their status. And I think that's kind of hurt the whole idea of Wings being... A band. I mean, it, during this interview, Paul does say that uh, Jimmy McCulloch was a, you know, a really good guitar player, and he liked Joe English a lot as a drummer. And if you look at the remaster uh, for Wings, it's dedicated to Linda and to Jimmy, which is really nice. But overall, whenever he talks about Wings, it's mainly about him and Linda. Right. And if you watch Wingspan, which uh, to me, you know, I like the whole idea of doing a documentary on Wings, but I almost kind of felt like he was telling the story as though it was the life of Paul and Linda after the Beatles. And Wings was whatever musicians he scooped up along the way. And it was like Paul and Linda's band. So I think that because Wingspan was done right after Linda's death, I think he really tried to elevate her status more 
by doing so. And I don't mind him trying to give Linda more credit because I do think Linda deserves a lot of credit. She has a lot right. to do with the sound of Wings, especially the harmonies in Wings, and whatever parts she had to handle on the keyboards, she was able to nail, whether it was simple or not. But, you know, she was an important member of the group, it's true, but I don't think that Paul has ever given that much credit to the other members of Wings, especially Denny Lane, who was there from start to finish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, because I noticed in that little introduction at the movie theater, um, every single wing is name-checked except for Denny Lane. Hmm. Um, now, yeah. now maybe, maybe I missed that, but, um, but, but I remember noting at the end, you know, he talks about, you know, it's good to see Jimmy doing this and Joe do that, and obviously he talked about Linda. Um, he didn't, I don't think that there was anything behind that, because um, a lot of people speculate that, Paul and Denny still have their differences after all that stuff in the 80s. Um, they've socialized together. They've seen each other. They've, they've buried the hatchet, as it were. I don't think that Paul's holding any particular grudge there, but I think he was just being forgetful. Regarding what Ken said, though, I think when Paul thinks back on that 10-year period, he remembers it as, you know, the first uh, decade of his marriage to Linda, um, the birth of uh, three of his kids, uh, yes, yeah, Mary was born in 1970, not 69, so yeah. Uh, he remembers it more at, for the family stuff, and I think that Wingspan, um, if it was billed more as a documentary on the first decade of the McCartney marriage and bringing up a family, that would have been more accurate advertising. Hmm. As At the time, people were billing it as the Wings Answer the Beatles anthology, which it wasn't in any way. And because, you know, with the Beatles, you have other people who own rights to the songs, other businessmen who have decided how, you know, these documentaries are getting put out, how the songs are getting pulled out, put out. Paul owns Wings. He pretty much owns the Wings story now. He's in charge of all the remasters and everything. You know, you're not going to see high, high, high selling Nike shoes. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. So... Paul has some control over how it comes out, and while at the time he wanted Wings to be a band, I think that's, uh, I don't think he's doing anything to hurt Wings consciously, but I think subconsciously he's made it more the Paul and Linda story, especially since Linda died. Right. You that's know, what I'm saying. There's been, yeah. Right. Yeah, <laughs> especially since she died, because Wing, Wingspan was a love letter to Linda, which, nothing wrong with Linda, nothing, nothing against Linda, but it wasn't as balanced as the Wings documentary could be. And it's no, you're, as, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And not only that, but I have to ask the question of what actually constitutes a Wings song. Because, <laughs> as you know, uh, in 2005, Paul did Too Many People on stage. And he said, this is for the yes, Wings fans. And even going back to last year when the Ram remaster came out, they put Little Woman Love on there as a bonus track on the uh, the extra, the CD of uh, mm -hmm. bonus songs. And all these years, Little Woman Love was the B-side of Mary Had a Little Lamb, a wing single. But in actual fact, that song really comes from the Ram Sessions. But all these years, I've known it as a wing song. So what actually, how can you define wings? What exactly is wings? Is wings even going back to Ram because then Isaiwa was on there, so he was the first drummer of, of wings? I mean... It gets a little bit confusing, and when you look at the compilation of Wings Span, which really technically is a Paul McCartney compilation and not a Wings compilation. Wings Span is a joke if, if, you, if you look at it as a Wings record. But I think a lot of people, just by because of the title Wings Span, they would think that it is a Wings compilation. It's a clever play on words, don't get me wrong, but it really is a collection of Paul McCartney's music through 1984 with his solo music mixed with Wings. But when you see it on a compilation and you see songs from the first McCartney album and Ram, and you've got duets on there like Say, 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 which don't really, you know, if you're thinking Wings, that's not you Wings. Yeah, no. You know, I think that it confuses people as to what Wings really was. And, um, you know, it's very hard to justify to a lot of people that Wings was a real band because... I know that you developed this page, which I, I did want to talk a little bit more about, that Wings should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But the perception that a lot of people have of Wings was that it really was Paul's band because, number one, all the hits were Paul songs, and they were all Paul vocals. And unlike a lot of the, 
the groups, the great groups of, of all time, the Beatles, Fleetwood Mac, the Eagles, where you had a lot of different vocalists on, on their albums, at least their hits were shared amongst them. So a lot of people don't look at Wings, unfortunately, as a real band effort, although the people who know the catalog and know that Wings at the Speed of Sound has every member with a lead vocal, you know, and Denny Lane did more as Wings went on, especially on London Town. Um, the people who know that might recognize Wings more as a band effort, but to the general public, it's hard for them to perceive Wings as something other than Paul McCartney's backup band. Well, maybe after the you know the reissues finally you know come out and have been around a while, maybe that'll you know change a at least a little bit. You think so, Josh? I, I I don't know. I think that people's minds are made up, and even with the reissues, it, it's not like it was with Wingspan, where it was predominantly Paul. But the problems are still there, and um, uh, I'm glad that Ken brought up Ram because Ram is an interesting animal, and. Uh, it bugged me when people <laughs> listed as a Wings album. It bugged me when Paul did that back in 2005 on Tour All Over. This is for the Wings fan. Uh huh. Um, I mean, and the lineup of Ram almost became Wings because Hugh McCracken was invited up right. um, before Wildlife, and he turned down the spot. So then it was offered to Denny Lane. So Ram, almost, Ram would have been, you know, technically the first Wings album had that been the first lineup. I consider Ram Wings Genesis or proto wings it's basically you know to wings what the quarry men were to the beatles in a sense but it's <laughs> that's funny. I have a hard time calling it a wings album and there's people out there who say as long as it has paul linda and denny on it it's wings you know like the denny's holidays album but then there's tracks on um tug of war and pipes of peace where you do have paul linda and denny right but um i would never call tug of war and pipes of peace wings album so i think it's kind of a case-by-case -case situation. I would argue that Holly Day's Danny's album could be considered Wings. It's got the Wings harmonies and the Wings sound. But Ram, Ram is the genesis of Wings. And unfortunately, due to stuff like this that Ken brings up and Wingspan and the ever-changing lineup, the li people like to bring up the lineup change all the time, and they say, oh, well, if you let Wings in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, who do you let in? Right. Right. Well, that's true. But do you do you honestly believe that Wings deserves to be put in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? I think that they deserve it. Um, definitely more than some of the people that are in there. And the answer that people give is, well, Paul's already in as a solo artist. And I'm hesitant to say, well, then it was a mistake to have him in as a solo artist because it's never a mistake to have Paul McCartney in any Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But it's, I think, you know. It, it, putting Paul in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame under Wings d and diminishing Wings uh, thing as a group, I think it's, I think that that's a serious mistake. You look at all the stuff that Wings accomplished. I mean, um, the Wings Over America tour itself was pro concert attendance records. We brought up Mullet and Tire earlier, which was the biggest selling single in Britain, knocking the Beatles off. And in fact, I think it's still the biggest non charity selling single because the times where it's been knocked off. Um, that was for charity stuff, like We Are the World or something, or uh, Eldon John's Princess Diana song. Right. I mean, I think that Wings should be in there, but there's, I've heard stories about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction board, and there is a lot of bias there. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, we've, talk, we've, definitely, we've talked about that several times here, and, yeah, there's, there's no question. There's, there's a whole lot of politics going on there. Um, look at the Monkees, for example. I mean, yeah, that's, that's a great example right there. The know. Moody Blues. Yeah, you know, Moody why Blues the Moody are Blues are not in there. <laughs> right. Or Ringo oh, as um, a solo artist, too, I think deserves to be in there. There's people who haven't accomplished one-tenth of what Wings has that are in there. And I had a book when I was a teenager from Billboard, of, and it gave you, there was lists in the back of, like, the top-selling artists and the top, you know, the ones who had the most chart entries, the ones who had the most weeks at number one. Mm -hmm. And... For the 70s, it was pretty much Wings, the Bee Gees, and Elton John. Right. right. Nobody touched the three of them in the 70s. That's true. And, and the Bee Gees and Elton are there. Yes, they are. So you, you believe that Wings should be considered something separate from Paul's post-Beatles career? I, I believe that they are. It actually it, it bothers me a little bit. I die a little bit inside when people say, what are your favorite Paul solo albums? And they're like, oh, well, Band on the Run. and It, it makes me wince, but... I try and say post Beatle instead of solo, but I understand, you know, that's, uh, that people are never going to stop calling Band on the Run a solo album. 
when they talk about Paul McCartney. So you I'm know, just as to time to live with that. as time goes on, and I you know I've been in radio for a long time. There are times that I've been at a radio station and will play a song like Band on the Run," and what it'll say on the computer is Paul McCartney. It doesn't say Paul yeah. McCartney and Wings. It's like Wings gets diminished and erased gradually as time goes on, and I don't want to see that happen. And when you watch something like Rock Show and you see what a great band they really were, it's a shame. It's, it gives you more of a reason to go and see Rock Show and, right. and to listen to these Wings albums where, when there was a lot of input from the other members besides Paul. Well, and I understand, too, the draw of Paul McCartney's name because uh, when my book comes out next year... It is going to, instead of the Wings compendium, it's going to be the Paul McCartney and Wings compendium, just because I know that if I put Paul McCartney's name on there, it'll come up in more Amazon.com searches. Uh-huh. Right. Uh, you know, people be, so I understand the reason, and I understand Concord, you know, putting Paul's name before Wings on Wings Over America, even though it wasn't like that in the first place. I just, I don't think Concord needs to do that. I think that, you know, people are going to know about the reissue. I think they got a great campaign for it. And that's another thing, too. You look at some of these Wings album covers, like Wings Over America. There's ones where Paul's face is not front and center. There is no sign of Paul McCartney on the original Wings Over America um, cover. There's no Paul McCartney on uh, Venus and Mars and Speed of Sound on the front cover. Right. right. That's an interesting... And both, I, I never thought about that, yeah. And all three of those albums, Venus and Mars, Speed of Sound, Wings Over America, that was when it was credited as just Wings. Right. So, I mean, looking at the cover, you would have no way of knowing that it was Paul McCartney at that point in time. I know that some record companies would put stickers on that said things like Paul McCartney and Friends, but more or less, that, that was how they packaged it. That was the faith that they had, because they did start off as Wings, but then for Band on the Run and Red Rose Speedaway, they switched to Paul McCartney and Wings, supposedly do the record executive uh, insistence, right. although that's beta too. Yeah. But the fact that it went just to wing shows you the fact that they were gaining momentum and picking up sales and establishing an identity as wings. Right. I mean, and no one's going to argue that Joe English was as big of a draw as Paul McCartney, <laughs> that Joe English contributed as much to wings as Paul McCartney. And nobody's saying that, but what it is is that it wasn't just Paul. There was a group effort, and Florence Huber had an interview with Beatle fan. Actually, I think it was Day Trip in Magazine, where what he said, and I'll never forget this, was when you go to see Paul live now, it's not the same. Something's missing. You don't have that three-person harmony with Paul, Linda, and Denny. Mm -hmm. The wing sound is very, very different from the Paul McCartney sound. Right. And, and boy, does that does rock show really point that up. Oh, it, really yes, does. it does. It really does. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time here. So, uh, Joshua, I just want to say what a what a thrill it was to have you on. And this was, uh, yeah, this was a great conversation. Thank you, Josh. And uh, yeah, certainly, I've gone on for another five hours. If you <laughs> Easily. I, I I think we I think we ought to have him back. Oh, definitely. Yeah, what do you think? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, certainly when when your book comes out, and um, anytime you want to talk wings. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, um, I enjoy your show. I've been listening since the first episode. And, um, I mean, obviously, I've listened to Ken and other projects that he's done. And Steve has been a, uh, a friend for years, so, you know, and I love Beatles Examiner. So uh, it was definitely great. I was very, very excited to be invited on for this. And uh, so, we look forward to having you join us again real soon. Yep. Yes, we sure do. Thank you. Thank you again, yeah. Josh. Uh, uh, most definitely. So, for the Beatles things we said today, this is Ken Michaels thanking everyone for listening, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. This is Joshua Lappin Bertoni. Thanks for having me on, everyone. And come go check out the Wings Over America reissue. <laughs>